There are a couple of levels why we might want to look at um, sustainability or environmental problems from the perspective, uh, from the from a global perspective. One is because many of these problems are common problems. So the, um, the issue of sustainability is one that uh, transcends all societies, and um, if you can uh, address it at an international level even if it's at a relatively broad or abstract level uh, in, uh, at that le in that way, you can then uh, share common experiences or tackle common problems in a way that avoids duplication, replication, maximises uh, learning and so on. So dealing with problems at a collective level uh, has that obvious advantage. And you could, But you could probably apply that to any problematic, whether it's a social problem, an economic problem, an environmental problem, whatever. Something that's particularly unusual about sustainability and environmental concerns is, of course, that there will often <coughs> be transboundary effects, which cannot be resolved within one jurisdiction. So, for example, if um, there is a steelworks um, on the boundary of two states, but located within one of those states, it might well have, um, it may well create pollution, which goes up into the atmosphere, gets blown across the border, and then deposits pollution in the uh, second jurisdiction. Now, that if you want to solve that problem, and maybe you don't want to solve that problem, but let's assume you do want to solve that problem, then you're going to need both parties to have a conversation. Okay, you've got a transboundary problem that cannot be solved unilaterally. And many environmental or sustainability concerns have that character. When you get to climate change, you get that squared. Because it's not because climate change is not a transboundary problem, it's a global problem. So pollution that's created in Chile will uh, create uh, a problem uh, a, a, a climactic will have a climactic effect around the world, whether in China or Chad. It doesn't matter where the pollution is created for the purposes of climate change. The effect is global. So if you're going, if you want to solve that problem, it's not that just that you need China and Chad and Chile to get on board, but you need everybody. You need a universal. You need universal buy-in to solve the problem, which is what the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, seeks to do. So, needless to say, there are a large number of difficulties that um, states have when they're trying to uh, achieve agreement on any particular sustainability or environmental problem. But I'll just net mention two, which are particularly common and particularly difficult and intractable. The first is what we call differentiation. Differentiation is a term of art in uh, international environmental law, and it recognises the fact that different states have made different contributions to environmental problems. So if you uh, think about um, a jurisdiction or a state like the United Kingdom, we have been uh, creating huge quantities of industrial pollution since about 1750 because we invented the Industrial Revolution. If you would compare that to um, a country on the other, in the global south, um, it's almost inevitably the case that they haven't done that. They might have started industrialising relatively recently, so they will have uh, they will be contributing, but not for the duration that we have. And in aggregate terms, they probably haven't contributed as much as we have. So this means that the um, common problems, which uh, of which climate change would be one, um, has been uh, caused differentially by different states. Which fairness dictates means that when we are imposing obligations on states to solve the problem, those obligations should be sensitive to the fact that different people have made different, different states have made different contributions. And that's called differentiation. It's a very difficult thing to agree on, though. So, for example, the, one of the reasons, the primary reason why the United States uh, declined to ratify the Kyoto Protocol was because 
they said quite accurately that this was a, an agreement which um, placed obligations on developed economies such as Western Europe, Japan, the United States, but no obligations on other major emitters such as China uh, or India or Brazil, which um, although were major emitters were not necessarily historic emitters, but they were nonetheless major emitters and of course in the interim between 1997 when Kyoto was um, agreed and today China has of course become the world's uh, largest emitter and almost by a factor of um, uh, 50%. So that, that's an example of differentiation, of course, in the form of the Kyoto Protocol. On the one hand, being perfectly understandable in that you, know, you treat historic emitters differently from newer emitters, but that differentiation having its own consequences, such as non-participation of all states. And if one of those states is the United States, that really does create a problem because your agreement may not be viable. So that's one difficulty uh, of uh, negotiation at the international level. Another would be far more fundamental, and that's about the nature of states. <clears throat> and one of the characteristics of states is, of course, that to a greater or lesser degree, states are sovereign. That is, they um, are, uh, have the sole authority or purport to have the sole authority to make laws and enforce laws and uh, deploy force within their territory. Now that means, the corollary of that, is that states, as between each other, are equals. They may not be in actual terms, but certainly in legal terms, they're equal. States are all equal. Now one consequence of this is that states cannot be compelled to undertake obligations that they don't want to. So they can't be compelled to join treaties or ratify treaties that they do not think are in their best interests. So if you're uh, trying to negotiate an agreement on any particular sustainability matter, you need to carry all states with you. You need to get comprehensive buy-in because if any state doesn't want to participate, they cannot be compelled to. As a matter of fact, obviously, states can be co coerced or persuaded or flat, flat out bribed in various ways. But that's a difficulty, that the sovereignty of states is a difficulty you have to deal with. In the UNFCCC, the way of agreement is what's known as consensus. So you have to acquire a consensus as between all states that they agree. And that's the basis on which um, agreements are made. Other um, regimes do it by, a, by virtue of a vote, but uh, even a 50% um, 50 plus one vote or a two-thirds majority or three-quarters majority. But there are a variety of different difficulties and they revolve around the um, challenge of sovereignty. So one of the um, best known uh, global frameworks in the environmental arena is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a, uh, one of the most uh, widely ratified, universally ratified in fact, um, agreements in international law. I think that uh, right now there are 194 parties, which is basically every uh, state on the planet, including microstates um, and the biggest and all of them in between. Um, and what it does, it's in some ways quite typical in that it um, has an objective, which you find in Article 2. Um, it, the objective is the stabilisation of um, uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, it has a set of principles, one of which would be differentiation, which uh, we've mentioned already. Others such as in intergenerational equity, um, uh, the um, principle of um, 
Uh, fairness also uh, makes an appearance, um, and uh, the precautionary approach are also mentioned. Uh, so there are a number of principles which guide the application of the treaty. Uh, there will be a set of obligations. Now, in the case of the UN, uh, UNFCCC, the obligations are very weak, which is why we have this annual process of negotiations to deepen the uh, obligations of states. So. The, uh, those negotiations are called the Conference of the Parties, a procedure which is established in uh, the uh, treaty. Um, uh, so the uh, Conference in the Parties in 1997 was held in Kyoto, out of which came the Kyoto Protocol. The Conference of the Parties in 2015 was held in Paris, out of which came the Paris Agreement, with which you're doubtless to become familiar. So these are um, some, so that would be a fairly typical uh, global regime. It also establishes institutions. It also establishes some institutions, such as the Secretariat, such as some of the scientific bodies that establishes. It also creates um, funding mechanisms or the ability to draw on other funding mechanisms, such as those established by the World Bank and so on. So they can be really quite comprehensive regimes. And what they do is to um, establish a framework that allows the regime not to solve every problem right now, but to establish a process which by iteration and progression will, over the duration, attempt to uh, become um, ever more sophisticated in its approach and accurate in its dealings, such that the problem can be better understood and thereby tackled.